Hello and welcome to 2021 Oz by Drone. Welcome. We're back. We're back. Hi, everyone. John Morrison here with you. How are you going, Greg? We're back indeed. I'm doing fine. What, what's been happening? Have you had a good month off? I have had a fantastic month off. It's been, uh, of course, summer here in Sydney, Australia. We had our fair share of rain. The monsoon rain came in. Um, did a lot of flying. It was good. I, actually, I did a lot of fun flying. And, um, oh, wow, we're into 2021 and still trying to work out what happened last year. Did anyone go? I mean, it, it seems like a blur now. But uh, having said that, it doesn't seem like it's over in any way shape or form so uh, yeah it's just good to be back in the show and and to see everyone again and look at the news we've had news um in the drone business so that's great we've got a lot of stuff coming up and indeed it has been fun to have some time off and uh try and forget 2020 but um let's hope that 2021 is going to be a lot better yeah anyway um we've got in the background our uh regular comedic um, relief, Lloyd, and also a little bit later today, we've got Angela, who's going to be visiting us as our guest today. Uh, Angela's from a channel called Lost Girl Hikes. I'm just trying to work out how that works. Does she get dropped in somewhere on a helicopter and get Uh, lost, not know how to get home, and then use a drone to hike home? We'll find out a little bit later. It sounds intriguing. Yes, most certainly. Yeah, so before we do anything, let's get into the news. And as always, Oz by Drone News is uh, brought to you by Air Data UAV. Is your drone healthy? Do you really know? Or is it about to surprise you on your next flight? Don't wait to find out. Discover under the hood information and review the early signs of problems before you take off again. Use the discount code OzbyDrone20 to get a 20% discount. There is a link to their website in the description. Now, John, before we do our, f- our first news story, you mentioned something just as we were getting ready today. Oh, um, yes, I'm very Air excited. Data. Air yeah. Data, yeah. We, uh, they, they had a special on till the, for January, and we've gone up to the Enterprise plan. So those of you who know this uh, software and use Air Data already know what that is. We get live streaming, uh, all sorts of fantastic goodies, uh, unlimited amount of drones and batteries. And so we've got it for a year. Um, and even for a small company like ours, you know, I've, I've had it for the last 12 months on a lower plan. I really, I've understood now that it's worth the, definitely worth the upgrade for us um, to have all of the information, have all our pilots under one umbrella, all the airplanes and batteries, everything taken care of under one platform. And I must say here in Australia too, while I'm at it too, in terms of compliance, because we're going to talk about that later, AVCRM, a fantastic uh, in Australia here for doing uh, job compliance. So alongside Air, uh, Air Data and AVCRM, two great products that really cover the lot. I mean, that's it. It's, it's in a bag for you with those two things um, in terms of, of operating safely and having all your records. So there you go. Love the enterprise plan. You can get a free trial um, from Air Data. Uh, so go and check that out. Ask for the free trial and you, uh, you'll you love it. Okay. And we'll have to get the folks from AVCRM to come on one day as well. But Absolutely. now let's get into our first yep. story of the day. Yep. And, of course, DJI is always in the news. Um, leaks are continuing to show about what the DJI FPV drone is going to look like before its release. Images of a DJI giveaway were shared online that mentions the first prize being a mysterious new DJI product. The giveaway requires entrants to create a story about themselves and a drone. On the page, it shares that the competition is open from January 29 to Feb 28, giving you about a month to submit your entry. But that's not the only leak. On a tweet that we saw from Osita LV, and certainly we've seen a lot of stuff from him before, we find a video that clearly shows the image of the product along with an unusual startup sound. Let's just have a look and listen carefully. Did you catch that? It's it's a bit hard to hear, but it's there. Play it one more time. Now, for some reason, that's not coming out of my headphones, and I think I know why. I tell you what, John, I'm going to throw to your camera for a minute, and I'm going to fix that audio. So let's just put John on camera. I can hear it. Um, so big thumbs up. Can you hear it, Angela and Lloyd? That that little that little audio. Yeah, we can hear it too. Yeah, that let me go. And... Might have might have come through. I try it again. Uh, Just have a quick chat about DJI FPV. I'll be back in one sec. 
So, first of all, the, the big thing I want to know is how fast is this going to go? Now, they haven't called it a racing uh, drone in any kind. It's called an FPV drone. But the word on the street, the thing has 150 kilometres an hour under its belt, um, which would be very, very exciting and probably mean that they'll be replacing a lot of them uh, through their care, their care package. Um, anything that goes that fast is going to need a lot of replacing. Um, but, uh, wow, that, that's exciting. Did you know that, Greg? Have you heard what the, uh, the Ford Speed's going to be on this aircraft? I have, but I can't remember what it was. But let me just play the video again one more time okay, to see if we, we fixed it. That's better coming through the correct yeah, audio yeah. channel now. So yeah, yeah look, it, it's yeah, it was it was coming out of the wrong speakers up here. But anyway, long story. Um, but interesting sound. I mean, it sounds a little bit like transformers. And your question about. What are the speeds going to be like? What's going to be happening with regard to will they have DJI care and so forth? If I was DJI, certainly I wouldn't be using their standard DJI care plan along with that particular aircraft. Well, you know, here's the thing. I, I look at that aircraft and I can see a whole new market um, for the aircraft. You know, people that are perhaps are going to be enticed by this type of machine. They want it for bragging rights. They want it for... They're not photographers, and, and they're excited by the sport of, of perhaps racing. But I can tell you that our, our existing um, uh, fan base for DJI are going to have it on their Christmas list for sure. Everyone who's, I believe, anyway, anyone who's got a Mavic 2 or a, an Inspire or whatever is going to want to have one of these or have a try of one. Um, so it will pique their interest as well. I think everybody's waiting to see. And having the, the version 2 of the DJI FPV system being so refined um, first, I think, is was a really good step in their engineering process because they were they really needed to get that right. They needed to have an, an absolutely bulletproof um, and really usable FPV system before they put it in anything. And I think that you know that was that was sorted. So uh, it's expensive. I don't think it's going to be cheap. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. Um reading the tea leaves and thinking if I was DJI and going to be offering some sort of DJI care, I'd be making sure that I had a rock solid black box inside the aircraft. And I'd only be paying out on DJI care if it wasn't in um, acro mode or something like that. You know, well, look, some... this is going to crash. You're going to crash this airplane. Absolutely. At those speeds, if, you, if you're going to flee and people are going to fly at those speeds, um, it's a whole nother level of flying. And if you're flying FPV, go. You know, we talk. We have the FPV guys on all the time here, and you know they talk about going through bags of propellers. They're builders because otherwise they wouldn't survive the sport. If you can't build and repair your own aircraft, then you're not going to survive because you're going to you're going to crash it twenty or thirty times even before you get your your basic skill set up. Mm. So that's an interesting part of it um, to see. I, I would have, and I and I I might be uh, wrong here. I would have worked on the simulator. So what for me to have a controller with the FPV goggles on and your computer so you can practice, 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 practice um, um, before you actually start flying the aircraft and get used to those kind of speeds would be the way to go. But who knows? That, that's probably in the offing. Um, someone will mm. tell me that in the chat for sure. So you mentioned a controller and we go into our second story of the day, which is the DJI controller. <laughs> A new product has hit the FCC test bench from DJI and it appears to be a motion controller for its upcoming FPV drone. After previously sharing news of a possible DJI joystick controller, it appears that it will be released with or close to the FPV drone. A new filing under the DJI name has hit the database and uh, the usual documents and FCC label has also appeared, giving us little insight at the moment into the upcoming product. But here's the interesting thing, a joystick controller for an FPV it's drone? At, it's astronaut designed. Astronaut yeah. designed, the, like the FT Aviator. No, I don't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, those sort of things are always come up. I mean, it's a lovely cell as well, an astronaut design. Uh, China, maybe a NASA astronaut. There you go. So, mm. um, 
uh, I, I don't even know where that goes in terms of the news. Uh, it's, it's a Chinese part, right, with a NASA astronaut design. The reason um, for the comment, John, was that, you know, th this is talking about a possible joystick controller and we'd previously seen um, something called an FT Aviator, which was a joystick style controller, which was... It had mixed reactions. I'll try to be generous in the way I comment well, about it. Years and years ago, um, when cars uh, became more and more popular, they mm. changed their controllers um, to a specific car type controller. And there were the original people that were into RC, of course, still always were using gimbal joysticks to control their cars. <clears throat> and we had the standard RC um, stuff to control cars. I didn't do a lot of car um, work myself. But I can remember the pushback when a new controller came in. And yet the new adopters that were coming in, the new people that were getting into cars, loved the controller. And now pretty much everyone accepts that a car controller with the trigger and the wheel is definitely the way to go. It's a very intuitive way of, of uh, driving a radio control car. So, you know, there, there is a more intuitive way. Let's just put this out there for um, our brains trust to consider. There's a much more intuitive way to control an aircraft than using two joystick gimbals, right, in, in terms Agreed. of what it is. You know what I mean? It's, it, we've come from, that's the dark ages of radio control, of having two gimbals. And, of course, you know, uh, uh, modern helicopters and aeroplanes have a single flight controller joystick and perhaps the thrust <clears throat> managed a different way. So, you know, it, we're about to maybe see that change, maybe see more into an aviation-style joystick uh, for future aircraft and probably makes sense. Probably makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, what does we, everyone think? We do joke about the FT Aviator, but the concept no, look, of, of what it was doing was absolutely awesome. Have no, you look got, at Lloyd's. Uh, Lloyd's got what, a Thrustmaster or something there. Yeah, I can't there see. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I hesitate to give the name of that particular flight instrument, but it is the Thrustmaster joystick, and we're just going to leave it at that. Is it a force okay. multiplier, Lloyd? Do you think? Um, it, it, yeah. Well, it's something about it's called a HOTUS, which is hands on uh, throttle and stick. So, that's right. you know, that's what they call it. But why they came up with the name of Thrustmaster, I don't know. But that's the design they should be using to fly these things, yep. you know, mm. uh, something along that. They could put a small thumb control on one side for the for the uh with a force feedback for the throttle and yeah. then your yaw your pitch your elevation all of that would be controlled with yeah. a with this uh with a hands-on controller like that it makes mm. that's the way it to does do it make sense yeah yeah yep. and just briefly going back to the, the that ft aviator so you know forward back left right um twist the stick for for your and yep. it had a thumb cap for um for elevation, for oh, you could have four or five switches on the hat. But no yeah. problem with that. You could you could select your hat. Yeah. You have trim. Um, you could change photographs. You can have a trigger. You can have in individual figure uh, finger triggers on a, on a stick yeah. like that. You know. Yeah. Um, the, the but the thing that went wrong with that, that, yeah, the thing that went wrong with that original product, they were trying to do it as a bolt-on product that would have cables going between it and an existing DJI-branded controller. Um, if yes. they had partnered with DJI and got their physical controller um, linked in directly without needing to have something else, that would have been a winner. Yep. Um, perhaps this is what DJI is looking at now. Just got to wait and see. The future's got to have voice command in it as well. So if you're flying very logically with a, a joystick and you were saying, um, you know, photo, focus, blah, 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 set the aperture, all of those mm. deeper menu items you can you can control by voice, um, very very easy. And I, I think that's what what we're going to see more of um, as the, as things progress. Just my two cents. Speaking of things progressing, drone delivery is a never ending topic in the drone scene. Some people claim that the day will never come when they'll be able to order a pair of tube socks online and have them <laughs> delivered by drone. One of the most lucrative drone delivery services has been in operation for a number of years without the public even being aware. The Toronto Star Report reveals that drones were used dozens of times on deliveries to Ontario Canada prison in 2019, shuttling in tens of thousands of dollars worth of drugs and <coughs> contraband, including smart watches. The results of a public information request 
revealed 27 reported incidents of drone flights to the prison in 2019, an average of slightly more than one flight every two weeks. I wonder mm. if they got a schedule. For example, um, on 1st of July, an Inspire capable of carrying a six kilo payload crashed shortly before 2 a.m. while ha hauling tobacco, mar marijuana, cigar leaves, two micro USB devices, two USB cords, two mini cell phones, three charging cables and four SIM cards and a partridge in a pear tree. Yeah. The institutional <laughs> value of the load was estimated to be 18,464. So. If, if anyone wants to get an Inspire, just one quick delivery, you can pay for it all. Now, let me tell you how to crash an Inspire with six kilos under it as well. That's double the aircraft weight. <laughs> well, mm, The thrust is, to weight ratio, you, if you carry three kilos with an Inspire. Anyway, that's another topic. That may be how they crashed it, but certainly the <laughs> six kilo payload is what they okay. um, quoted in the report. Obviously wow. a little bit different from reality. No, I, I believe you could do it, but as I say, it'd be a hard one to fly um, any sort of distance. But look, that it, it's ongoing. Um, many of the listeners know that Morrison Aero Robotics, my company, does that that work, and we we actually uh, do a lot of work with corrections here in Australia, more or less training the prison staff to look out for them. They've got um, aeroscope detection units and so forth, and just how the whole thing works and. We're able to, you know, to, to, to stop them a lot of times if they're training. But one of the things that was never really imagined was training prison guards um, about the aircraft, what they're likely to do, how they operate, where they might drop things and all of that, completely uh, unknown to them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to continue for a long while and it, it won't just happen in prisons. It'll happen uh, in all sorts of other places as well where, where people want to deliver things perhaps illicitly. Um, Stay tuned for that one. Yep. I'm just imagining someone one day coming up with the idea of, um, you know, 30 minutes or it's free for drone delivery of other substances. But anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, price per kilo, um, Greg, if you were delivering those sort of substances, um, yeah. you know, that the, it would certainly be a lucrative deal. Um, so we might see a, a, a del drug delivery trade um, pop up not too distant future. Anyway, moving yeah. on. So drone shots are saying I've seen an Inspire One version two lift seven pounds. Was it? So there's yeah. a quote from one of our regulars. Seven pounds. Maybe it was pounds they're talking about. I don't <clears> know. Six yeah. kilos is a decent weight. Let me tell you. Probably, I know what that probably is. an error in someone doing mm -hmm. pounds for kilos. But uh, yeah. our next story: when you get on board a passenger aircraft. You like to assume that it's been undergoing regular maintenance and pre-flight checks. But what about unmanned aircraft? We check the propellers are okay, that the battery isn't cracked or puffy, that there's nothing amiss with the fuselage. But what about more detail checks? And um, how do you do that at scale? What about drone swarms or fleets of autonomous drones? NASA recently posted about their fit to fly initiative. What if a drone could sign off with a standard recognized digital certificate? that offers assurances that it's safe to be in the air. The proposed system combines data that the drone can gather itself with human-generated input for other periodic maintenance to keep drones in compliance. And one of the things just out of interest that it does look at, it looks at the RF signals with this proposed system. So it can say, hey, no, is there too much other transmission on what's happening locally um, in the uh, in the spectrum that you're using, making sure that it's clear air rather than interference. I think it's a good initiative. Yeah, I think a scope there for machine learning as well. And in mm. terms of when, when uh, this software starts to improve and develop itself, the more pre-flight checks and the more uh, checks it does, it's gathering the data on what the lifespan and, and uh, of the components are and so forth and how many times it can be checked. So there's real... Um, you know, it's, well, basically that's what we're using air data for these days. We look at the batteries over time. Um, <clears throat> we can tell at the moment that there's definitely scope for looking at that with machine learning. Yeah, but this is meant to go one step further and actually thinking of it as an airworthiness certificate. Um, mm -hmm. That's what they're claiming anyway. Certainly more to have a look at with that one. But speaking of compliance, Drone Cloud has announced that Network Rail has selected it to deliver drone management software for its already in use drone fleet. <laughs> The partnership spans over five years to develop and license the company's drone fleet management software. 
Network Rail plans to use the software to manage its drone fleet during projects, rail inspections, surveys and monitoring. The platform will also be used to track flight records, logs, maintenance, pilots flying the drones and most importantly to ensure that all operations are compliant. Again, another compliance platform. Yeah, exactly. Similar sort of thing. Um, yeah, and that's going, to, that's going to be more and more of that. Um, we mentioned AVCRM uh, earlier as well being a compliance platform. AVCRM stands for Aviation Compliance uh, um, uh, Risk Monitoring, yeah, Compliance and Risk Management, I should mm -hmm. say. Paperless, um, you know, idea. But, of course, it integrates all of the, if you've got, like, basically tracking of the aircraft hours, tracking pilot currency, um, tracking, you know, and if it signs off at the end and says, yeah, you're good to go, um, it's, it's a pretty good bet that you are. You've still got to have someone oversee the document if you're doing commercial operation and have it signed off. But um, the, the software is very well advanced in terms of how it looks at aviation risk and compliance. Yeah. Okay. We've got one more quick story that we're going to have a look at, and this one's going to put a smile on your face. In a swamp just north of Newcastle, a team of researchers is on the hunt for one of Australia's most secretive wetland birds, the Australian bittern. The large heron-like bird lives among the tall reeds of wetlands. Was a heron-like bird? Yeah, uh, lives among the tall reeds of wetlands, mainly in southeastern Australia. It is estimated that there are only 2,500 left in the world. The team has been using song meters, which I believe is a recording device, song meters, to record the bittern's distinctive call and the source of its nickname, the bunyip bird. The team has now pinned all of its hopes on a thermal imaging camera attached to a drone to get visual confirmation of the sounds that they recorded. I don't have a video on this one, but it's you know an what? interesting I and amusing it's story. enough material for us for there for 12 months. A heron-like bird... <laughs> Uh, to start with uh, in the swamp is get a, just a great place to start, you know. And I can think of a heron that lives in a swamp myself um, and and visits this show. So that's there you in go. Tennessee, gonna, though. Yeah, that's right. We're going to have we're going to have a year's worth of stuff out. So keep that photo handy. Yeah. Um, and in reference to heron like birds, because I first I thought a heron like bird was a pigeon myself. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but again, just let me remind you, the name of this was the bunyip bird. Yes, the bunyip bird. Mm. Do, do, Lloyd, do you know, swamp bird. Do you know what a bunyip is, Lloyd? Uh, no, and I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> okay, um, you'll have to look that one up because it's going to be one of the Stump the Yank questions later on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Look, um, We've got to that time in the show. Let me just have a look here. I, I, I merged two stories together by mistake, but the next story, let's just do one more quick little piece. And this one, it, this story just... <sighs> the Smellicopter is an open source drone project which was um, built using Crazy File 2.0 with some additional off-the-shelf sensors for obstacle avoidance and stabilization. The interesting bits are a couple of passive fins to keep the drone pointed into the wind, and then the sensor called an electroantanogram. To make one of these sensors, you need to harvest an antenna from a live hawk moth. The antenna is hollow, meaning that you can stick some electrodes into the hollow piece. Whenever the neurons in the antenna encounter an odour that they're looking for, they produce an electrical signal that the electrodes pick up. Plug the other end of the electrodes into a voltage amplifier and a filter and run it through an analog to digital converter. And you've got a chemical sensor that weighs just 1.5 grams and consumes only 2.7 milliwatts of power. Check this wow. out. Yeah, we do call it the smellicopter. Yep. My name is Melanie Anderson. I'm a PhD student in uh, mechanical engineering. I work on the smellicopter. So the smellicopter can do two things. It can smell odors and follow those to the source, but it can also avoid obstacles while doing that. The main thing is the antenna right here. This is an antenna from a live moth, the smelling organism of the moth, and it serves as the odor sensor for the drone. 
The antenna is, is kind of like a tube. So what we're able to do is take really thin metal wires and stick those into the ends of the antenna. So this has some floral scent. When the antenna gets activated from odors, then you're able to measure that Someone's electrical signal there. as a spike. <laughs> okay. So the smell copper now, when I it won't smells play the odor, entire video. I'll get Lloyd to um, get the video from our um, run sheet and put the link into the description. Let people go and watch the video at its source. It's an incredible story. The, the whole idea of using a small piece of a moth, obviously it's been sacrificed to get its sensor, I assume, and then using that to go and hunt odors. I'm waiting for Lloyd. I know he's just poised there, ready to press the button. But to hunt and search and find the source of an odor, it's an incredible I mean, idea. Up, we wake up every day and to find that the, you know drones are doing more and more different things. I mean, my first thought was that somewhere at the moment there's a hawk moth flying around going, I just can't seem to smell anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, boom, but, crash. Boom, boom. Look, uh, there's a lot of... His friend, I'm not even hungry. You know, I, I can't smell... And, but, you know, uh, it is remar it's remarkable. It is. And, uh, you know, I can imagine just how busy a smellicopter would be at Lloyd's place. <laughs> but th there's so <laughs> many... <laughs> I mean, there's so many good batteries, uses. Multiple yeah. batteries. Uh and it avoids obstacles too, you know, I like that as well. So. All, all jokes aside, the ability to use something like this to, for example, gas leak detection for yeah. public utilities um, yep. in, in coal mines. Yeah, there are um, fairly, or, fairly advanced adapt, uh, uh, adapters already um, and sensors for that kind of work that doesn't really uh, need a moth to contribute its. But, of course, the idea of, of uh, the other part of this, which is kind of great, is, is nature um, provides the the uh, answers, you know. Again, once again, uh, nature showing us how how it's incredible um, at why it does things is able to help us out. I'll just add one more point though. Having read the article in more detail, they the they did compare the ability of this solution to using other more technical solutions, and the technical solutions are very narrow band focused on one particular thing that they're searching or seeking out, whereas yeah. using this particular solution, it's able to be programmed for particular scents or smells. So that's the reason that it's particularly of interest to them. But anyway, mm. all those things being as they are, I think, and I, I'm trying to press the button to bring the guest on screen, but the button's not working. Let's just go and bring in our guest right now. Where are you, Angela? Can you see me? We can see you. I saw you chuckling. You as. Me. I saw you chuckling at a couple of those stories there. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good, especially the one with uh, visiting Lloyd's house with that smell of copter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, can, I don't want to imagine. Yeah, let's not imagine. So, Angela, welcome and thank you for joining. Um, before we do anything, talk to me about the name of your channel, Lost Girl Hikes. Um, did you get lost once and how, how did the name come about? Well, the name came about um, kind of being lost in the moment of where you are and, um, you know, just trying to find time to enjoy where you're at and outdoors. So I put two and two together and came up with uh, Lost Girl Hikes. Okay, so getting lost in the moment. Now, tell yeah. me about some of the areas that you have been hiking and uh, recording on your channel. Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, we took a trip. Uh, me and my mom took a trip up to... Um, Washington, and we did a couple of hikes up on Mount Rainier and all that stuff. And um, I've been interested in doing the Pacific Crest Trail. It's a long uh, trail hike. And I haven't really done very many long trail hikes. I kind of do section hikes. And um, mostly around Texas is where I hike at. Okay. And obviously, this is a drone show, so you must have some drones as part of what you're doing. Oh, One for or sure. more drones. Tell me about what tech you use. Oh, I use a DJI Mavic Pro 2 Zoom. Okay. Yep. And, um, and that's the only. That's the only one you've got. Yep, it's the only one I got. Okay. Look, let's go and um, uh, bring up the first. We've got three clips. We're going to have a look at a little bit of each of them. Let's bring up the first one. 
Sure. Thanks for showing my stuff. Yeah. So tell me, um, what are we looking at here? And I've cut the audio. Um, I don't have license to use that, but talk to me about where we are here and where you're going. Yeah, well, sorry about the shoes. Uh, <laughs> um, actually in Oklahoma, that's on the Talamina Highway. It's a scenic route. It's about an hour full of scenic uh, views of showcasing the hills, countrysides, and it's um, really pretty during the fall time. Okay, and I was nice. trying to show I, I was trying to showcase um, all the stops along the way and the sites that you get to see. Beautiful and aerial footage there. I love the I love the sun shining through the cloud there, the rays there. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect uh day the time of day. I hit it just right. I remembered that there was um some fog that always rolls in around that area. So I was trying to hit it up before uh, it became later part of the day. And some beautiful colours there on the on the ground there as well. Oh, oh thank you. And the second video, well, let's play the second clip and just explain. Let me um, briefly interrupt, though. Metro Drones, thank you. Thank you for your super chat. Happy Friday, everyone, and happy $10 super chat from Metro Drones. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Metro. So the second clip we've got is not your traditional drone clip. Nope. Um, but it's got drone footage in there. Mm -hmm. It is all drone footage. I just uh, mirrored it and did a kaleidoscope effect. I, I started looking and at this out. and this is absolutely mesmerizing. You can sit and watch and just loop it almost. It's some, This is something that I could imagine being on a um, screensaver on an Apple TV or mm -hmm. something like that. This is just absolutely stunning. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't It just accidentally happened and I, I was trying to throw some videos together and see how it worked out and it came out pretty good, I think. Yeah. Different. So, while that's playing, talk to me about when you when you were choosing your drone, how did you pick what you were going to use for your flying? Oh, um, yeah. Originally, I had a DJI uh, Phantom. Mm -hmm. um, it did get stolen, unfortunately. So it put me in the market for a new drone to look, look for try out and I was looking for something that was travel travel size and you know easy to take on the trails so nobody could see you what you're doing <laughs> yeah. and uh, that's how I that's how I chose that drone and in terms of the um, let me get you back on screen for a little bit the sure. the phantom that you had before which one which model phantom was it uh, phantom 3 phantom 3 okay <laughs> Yeah, I mean, John and I are certainly fans of the Phantom 4 Pro because of its camera. Mm -hmm. um, have you compared, have you flown someone else's Phantom 4 Pro and how would you compare it yourself? Um, I think it's got real great quality work for sure. Uh, a lot better than the 3. Mm. Um, but I haven't gotten a chance to fly it, unfortunately. Okay. Any any thoughts or questions from you in the background there, John? Yeah, I... I um... I'm sort of interested too because I've got, but as I say, I've got both the Phantom out of mm -hmm. the Mavic Pro and the Zoom. I really love the Zoom. I, lo I like having yeah. the Zoom. I, I, you know, first of all, and we've had a few of these, of course, in the business. Um, but I found I was always going to the Zoom to take it. I could get the results of the shots I wanted. There's certainly some different um, ed an edge with the Pro, but the Zoom just allows you. Uh, on, in the wow. moment to be to be a, a little bit more creative. I like the dolly idea that it does, um, being able to, to pan and zoom at the same time. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's just a whole different way of shooting, um, and uh, I, I really like it. I, I see mm -hmm. interesting you chose that one too. Did you do you compare the pro and the zoom? Um, what, what what was your decision there based on? Yeah. I mean, I know you can do a lot of post editing and uh, do the zoom option through post editing, but at the same, I, I just, I like how it was already there and the functionality of it mm. was already present. What do you work on you know, for your post? Um, I use a Wondershare for Filmora Pro. It's on the cheaper side of Adobe Premiere. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So, okay. I, I like it. It's pretty, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Well, it allows you to do all of that that creative work, and of course, you know, when you've, you've got a lot of options there, if you've got 
got good software. I, I've, I've noticed, have you ever used any of the onboard editing software for things that DJI include um, these days? Mm. I know it's not really considered professional work, but I'm, I'm seeing the speed, you know, of some consumer um, users just love to be able to cut and paste and do all sorts of effects um, on, this ta on their tablet quickly after they've shot it um, and then post it up. It's very, very quick and easy. Yeah, I've seen um, some of the good stuff that comes out of the editing through the DJI system. And I have uploaded from it, and it does pretty good. I've, I've used it a couple times just to, when I don't have the Wi-Fi capabilities on my mm -hmm. computer and I throw stuff together and yeah. through, through the DJI app. Mm. So it's well, got its a, advantages. It's a great concept you've got. And I mean, I, one of the things I'm, I'm sort of always yeah. aware of is that aerial photography takes you to that location. Um, yeah. You know, you can take a picture of something, a tree or something magnificent, and it might be a number of, you know, thousands of locations, but aerial photography tends you to take you to specific places of beauty um, and they, mm -hmm. they have their unique horizon, they have their uh, unique landscape and colours and, and so aerial photography is, uh, is, is uh, certainly um, the way to capture travel because you, you, you can go to these different place, specific um, places mm -hmm. when you're in the air. So uh, great idea, great idea, love it. Yeah, just, a love reminder, it. <laughs> just a reminder, just a reminder that <laughs> Angela's channel link is being posted by Nightbite every so often so people watching do go check out Angela's channel and uh, say hello and subscribe if you like what you're seeing there quick little interruption we had a message from Wayne King a $10 super chat hi Greg, John and Lloyd and Lost Girl Hikes great videos so Wayne is liking what he's seeing there hopefully he'll come over and join your channel in a few moments um, let's go and have Let's go and have a quick look. We've got one more video from you. Let's go and bring that one up. Oh, sure. Oh, that one. Oh, that was that was a fun one. <laughs> so where are we? We're in Colorado, Phantom on Phantom Road. Um, it's just shoot, I forgot the location of it already. Um, Gunness, uh, I can't remember what city it was by. Canyon but City. Cannon City, thank you. Yeah, where the uh, state <laughs> penitentiary is at, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I didn't fly over that. I didn't fly my drone over that way and deliver any of those goods. <laughs> I was about, about to about. ask, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's a um, another highway view scenic route. And it's it's... A uh, one car lane only, it felt like most times. You know, it's funny, so your, your, your video here reminds me of something I did see in the news that we didn't um, run today. Um, Big Sur, there was a, 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 a landslide that affected um, a road in Big Sur. And I'm just seeing that my Mac has on its screen right now. Mac OS Big Sur 11.2 update is available. Obviously, that's fixing the... Uh, landslide but all jokes aside oh, wow. some beautiful footage oh <laughs> well i'm glad there wasn't one there <laughs> we would have been yeah, in trouble no, no landslides in your one quick interruption five dollar super chat from artco drone solutions thank you um, and a great guest to have online thank you very much for oh, joining us thanks. angela thank you guys so much for having me and talking with me yeah tell me what's what's the future plans for you and your drone and your photography Oh, for sure. Um, I have this uh, idea where I plan to use my work for travel and transfer um, with my work somewhere new every six months. So I'm hoping to get to explore an area a little longer than, you know, the typical uh, week stay vacation trip. So I'm looking to stay uh, a little longer in the area and do some hiking and some more um, aerial footage. Hopefully. That sounds absolutely wonderful. I'm just seeing in yes. the channel someone um, interesting that I watch um, in the chat there, Clash with Bow. It's totally non-drone related um, channel, but um, he's got some <laughs> crazy stuff. So hello to Clash with Bow. Who else have we got online today? We've got uh, Wayne Grumpy Vlogger Ten Toes, RL Photography, Northeast Drone Productions, Metro Drones, Matt Cundiff, Joe Blaylock, Gary Bauer, Clash with Bauer, Chris Hope, Brad Alston, Bob Casey, Ariel, and Artco. 
I can see those people in their live today. Thank you for being part of what we're doing. But let's now let's move everybody. on. Let's now move on. There's something else that we do that's um, a little bit unique to uh -oh. our show, and it is this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to play Stop the Gang. Yeah, that's oh, no. right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to have a bit of fun with some Australian trivia. It's time to ask some questions from one yank to another. The honorary Aussie Lloyd Mendenhall will be quizzing for Stump the Yank. Okay. Howdy, uh, everybody. Let's yeah. go and bring that down. Yeah. So, I'm Angela, I did warn you about this earlier. We just have a little bit of fun with it. and. <coughs> You know, there were a few Aussie words that came up in some of our past shows and people mm -hmm. were in the chat room going, huh? So we thought we'd what? have some fun with it. So that's the <laughs> where it came from. Okay. okay. I'm going to start with one. That, I'll try uh, my best. Yeah, well, I'll, this one, John may, John may know this, he may not. But when what do, what do they mean when somebody says, let's have a butcher's? Now, is that a name of an Australian sandwich or a British sandwich? Or is that to... Ladies and oh. gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to play. Is song again? <laughs> oh, yeah. no, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. My, okay. question, well, my, my answer. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, is it, me? Is it uh, like I said, a name of a famous Aussie sandwich or a British sandwich? Uh, is it the name of a beer? Butcher's beer, you know? I don't know. Yeah. Or does it... I don't know, maybe just to, does it rhyme with something? Now, they're famous for their beers, you know. I would and of course, think it'd be a they beer. like their meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, the, I like beer. I would think it would be the beer. I, I Actually, know what the, it is. You know what you? it is, John? I, I didn't know this. I did not know this. And if, tell me, what does it rhyme with? What's the, what is it? it it's uh, actually when you're going to have a butcher's at something. Uh, yeah. It, it's a rhyming slang phrase, and and the old phrase just comes from butcher's hook. So Which you know, we would rhymes we would, with look. Look. It yeah, means you're uh -huh. going to have to have a butcher's means you're going to take a look at something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know that one. <laughs> yeah. Trivia point on this. <laughs> Where did I learn it from? <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh, I'm going to guess that guy up there. No. No. Actually, I learned it off of Doctor Who. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> they use it. Well, it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, it comes from the English. It, mm. Yeah. It rhymes. The other okay. one we use, um, Lloyd, quickly, just is on that same one, is motor. Have you got your – it's a bit, um, it's a bit uh, soldiers outside. Have you got your motor? And that would, that's just a simple one. It's motorboat. Have you got your oh, coat? Yeah. Okay. Just filling in the blanks there. Go ahead. Next okay. question. The next was... one, Angela. <laughs> okay. Is uh, uh, Billabong. Now is, you know, because they're pretty liberal down there in Australia, they have the cannabis and stuff. Is that something <laughs> they smoke with? Or is it the name of a, the, the can that they carry on their hip when they're out in the outback, you know, it either has either whiskey, beer, or water <clears throat> or is it the name of a dry pond Angela? i like whiskey but uh, hmm. uh i'm gonna go with the uh not so obvious one this time and go with the pond that's correct it is a pond oh, in a dry riverbed <laughs> yeah I yep. got it. <laughs> so That's right. let me jump in with the one that we um, mentioned earlier in the show with regard to the um, nickname for the heron bird, the bunyip. Now, oh, Lloyd, did you Google it? Did you have a look, see what it was? No, I did not. Look, I don't have an ABC list there, but just out of interest, the bunyip is a creature from Australian Aboriginal mythology said to lurk in swamps, billabongs, creeks, riverbeds and waterholes. The bunyip was part of traditional Aboriginal beliefs and stories throughout Australia, while its name varied according to tribal nomenclature. So a bunyip, it's kind of like the Australian Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> That's the oh, way I, I maybe describe it's it. Like, I thought maybe it's like a snipe. <laughs> I would she have guessed no idea. that. 
<laughs> she, do you, you know what snipe hunting is, right, Angela? No. You've, snipe you've hunting? Never heard of, snipe hunting, yeah. Yeah. I guess you have like a snipe Sniping scope in here. Yeah, well, it's t it's not for this show, but I'll t I'll I'll tell it on no. my show. It's a it's a <laughs> it's an old tradition, but it's something along with being able to hunt Bigfoot here in Oklahoma. Now we also hunt snipe in Oklahoma. <clears throat> but let's move on. The next one. Uh, okay, this one you might know. Budgie smugglers. Yeah. Now, are. <laughs> Are budgie smugglers people that, uh, well, budgie smugglers? Yeah, budgie smugglers. They, uh, they sounds like a whiskey thing. It sounds like a whiskey thing. Well, I was going to ask: Is the name of a famous <laughs> whiskey? Is it? Uh, is it a? I don't know. Speedos, or is it uh, oh pirates? The way they used to, you know, it, pirates that used to steal birds out of Australia because, like, they have cockatoos there that we pay a fortune for here. Uh, and budgies being a general bird is that that is it the pirates is it the speedos is it or is it the name of a really good beer you guys and your beer <laughs> um i'm gonna go with the speedos i, I have no idea that sounds like and do not I ask me to <laughs> Yeah, do not ask me to explain why they call them budgie smugglers. I'm not even going to go down that road. But you know what the term budgie uh, yeah. is, though, don't you, Angela? <laughs> do what? Budgie. You know the word budgie? Small bird. No, I don't know the word. It's a budgerigar. It's a small bird. <laughs> yeah. So if yeah, you can work out. Bird. Okay, let's leave that alone. Yeah. Small bird eggs. <laughs> okay. We're going to pause right there and uh, leave our stump the yank for today. Angela, thanks for being our guest. Thanks for being part of the Thank show. You. And uh, people, please do go check out the link that's in the description and uh, check out Angela's channel. By all means, stay in the background and uh, we're going to continue with the news. Who knows, we may hit you up with a quick little side uh, bit of trivia later on during the show. But thanks very much, Angela. Thanks, Angela. Great work. Bye. Yep. Bye -bye. Absolutely a pleasure having you on the show. Okay. Bye. Now, let's move on. Over here, we've got our next story, John, which um, I did actually do last week very briefly, but uh, I wanted to do it with you here. A DJI drone deployed for a commercial photography job crashed into a Sydney high-rise apartment block, injuring an occupant, according to reports in The Australian. The drone operator reportedly lost control of the drone after flying at approximately 10 metres high in front of the building. The incident took place on January 15th at around lunchtime while the drone was taking <coughs> photos in the Darling Harbour area of Sydney, New South Wales. The craft flew sideways directly into the high-rise building at speed. The drone shattered the glass, which resulted in the occupants sustaining minor injuries from the shards. Flying the craft was an employee of a company called Sky Monkey, which is a CASA licensed and certified drone operator. Now, this is not the real footage. We just no, no it was no. something. It was something that happened to um, come up on the article that we saw, and we thought we'd have it for amusement value. But John, yeah, we we hypothesised about it last week. What's going to cause yes. that set of symptoms to happen? Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, Cover Drone, one of the major insurance underwriters, uh, yesterday released um, their fi annual figures, and they've been compiling figures for a while, um, of course, being the insurance industry. And quite clearly, 49% of all drone accidents or incidents are pilot error. Now, that's half. So, you, you know... it. it it walks like a duck, or looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it might be a duck. Now, there's not nothing to say here that this wasn't an equipment failure at all, nothing at all. But uh, you have to look deeply at, at how the setup was and whether there was pilot error, uh, pilot input error, and what it was. Now, first of all, Sky Monkey are fairly experienced operators. They have a number of Inspire 2s, I believe. That's the aircraft they're using generally for their work. So and it was an Inspire that reportedly crashed, yeah. Yep, they're a small, they're a small company um, of five um, pilots, I think. And so they, uh, it's not a, you know, it's 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 not one of these fly-by-nighters, um, excuse the pun, that just has a whole lot of people working under a real. They're actually a a, a bona fide company, um, and so they'll they'll need to look at it too. If 
one of the things that you know is going to come out of this is first is if the aircraft did a flyaway that wasn't pilot error and remember pilot error is not just dumb thumbing the sticks and flying into the building pilot error is set is doing something setting up something automated a shot where you programmed it incorrectly um to do what it's going to do um and so you know there's been an error there as well that's still pilot error there's a lot of things that cover um operator error pilot error in terms of how it could have happened one of the things the discussions i wanted to bring up about it because i think we don't know enough to make any decisions um or, or make any uh, criticism of the operator or the pilot until we find out more um and and th even then you know criticism uh, is not really the constructive thing here it's actually to look at what happened so that we in aviation we look at mistakes that are made and things that are happen we learn from them and so that other operators don't fall into the same trap there's not necessarily a punitive process that's involved here but one of the risk mitigators that comes up in the beginning was and i i if you were flying that with a mavic 2 you wouldn't have broken the window and you wouldn't have had the accident and so there's a there's a case here for the mass of the aircraft every time if you flew it with a mini 2 and you're able to get the shot that you required it was suitable uh, for whatever it was, whether it was a social media uh, campaign or whatever, and the footage was good enough, take it from me, everybody, fly the lightest aircraft that you can in any situation in an urban environment. Absolutely. Working with heavy octocopters and heavy aircraft is very, very dangerous in, all, in circumstances when you're in urban environments. You absolutely need to know what you're doing and have a lot of confidence in the, in the material. You know, the big octocopters that work in the film industry are working in closed sets, um, very, very controlled environments often, and, you know, the, and the film industry has been doing that with stunt work for a long time. They blow stuff up. They, they know how to manage a site to make it safe for the people that are on it, and they, they have people that actually do that. If you're going to roll up with a large aeroplane into an urban environment like Darling Harbour uh, in the middle of the city, in the middle of the CBD, um, you know, you want to have a real think about what damage you might happen, not because of your incompetence, because of a failure, a, a propeller failure, engine failure, whatever it might be in a quad um, that's going to set you up for trouble. So I'll leave that one out there for the Brains Trust too, everybody. You know, it, um, they've been Can inspired. I ask you, John, can I ask you on that line of thought, how much do you need to battle communication with your client who's, who wants the big shiny looking professional aircraft have you seen that as an issue absolutely i fell for it myself and i can tell you the actual story i was booked to do 60 minutes i was doing a shot up in the hunter valley i turned up with a phantom to do the job we were going to do some close-in work um where there were going to be lots of people on site and we elected to use the phantom four and the the producer said that's not the drone we're used to seeing you know and i said you're used to seeing the one with the, the legs that go like this. He said, yeah, that's the one. Where's that? Where's that? And I said, we won't be using that today. Um, but, because I didn't have one available, but I went and got another one because I thought, oh, that's what they want. You know, TV networks are used to seeing an Inspire. So if you haven't got an Inspire, you're not really one of the people that does that job. Um, oh, I think, yeah, more and more, uh, we, we that is a pressure the commercial operators feel and one of the reasons why the UNEC Typhoon that we fly this week is popular a hexacopter you know sometimes people see another couple of rotors on there and they think oh that's better than the, the ones we've seen before or there is always that perception um, and I, I but I think <clears throat> at the end you know stands by the footage that you can shoot and how safely you can get it I can see uh, you can put a lot of Mavic 2 stuff up against an Inspire um, and honestly, it's only the only the very very sharp operator that knows what they're doing with that aircraft that will get you a better job with the experience. Um, for most purposes, um, you know, an experienced person will do uh, the same job with a smaller aircraft. So that's just my two cents about the whole scenario. We don't know, as I said, we don't know enough about the accident to make a real judgment call on that yet. We really don't. Yeah, Casero said it's going to be a Q3 report that's going to come out to have a look at that one. Yep, Oops, so right. I looked at the wrong one. That was our last one. How about I go to the next story, which is this. Google, firefighting has been cancelled. Google has abandoned a request to test drones for firefighting. They had previously asked the US Federal Aviation Administration for permission to test a drone uh, for monitoring and fighting fires. However, its drone plans have since been extinguished. 
The Google Research Group asked for permission to operate an unmanned aircraft system called the HSC UAV M8A Pro, which weighs between 55 to 99 pounds. That drone made by Homeland Surveillance and Electronics for agricultural purposes, like spraying chemicals on crops, could in theory be fitted with water or other chemicals to put out a fire, according to the Bloomberg report. Google, though, has no immediate plans to re-engage on this work, according to a spokesperson. Um, this was originally submitted a year ago. What do you think? Should Google continue their work or have they just worked out that it's not going to be profitable? I, I just I thought Google was a search engine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, well, you know, there, 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 there are a lot, of course. Um, you know, emergency service and firefighting is a very specialist type thing. They just want to, they're looking at to associate their brand with something. Um, mm. You know, Westpac uh, um, have a long standing relationship with surf lifesaving and with firefighting here and the, the Little Ripper project. Westpac are a major bank, of course, for those in America. We have here Westpac. Uh, and the bank, you know, likes to have its brand on, on things of community service. Mm. I understand that element of it. Yeah, you know, pulling the pin, I mean, um, you know, they've got their, they've got, I suppose, a lot of things to consider there. We've got a long way to go before we do any type of firefighting with unmanned aerial vehicles unless they're, you know, 747s. Um, mm. You know, otherwise you, you're, just, you're just taking a toothpick to a sword fight, really. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there is that. I mean, I think there's surveillance. They're great. Um, but anyway, that's probably why the idea was extinguished wouldn't you say I know. Lloyd? <laughs> i've got three stories left and five minutes to cover them in vertiport um, a startup called urban airport has partnered with hyundai to help secure a 1.2 million pound grant from the british government and located in the uk town of coventry urban airport service could be operational by november of this year allowing for expanded testing of ev toll drone integration within cities do you think it's going to take off? Boom, boom. Yep, absolutely. Best thing to have at an airport or any type of site that size is a drone. Absolutely. Um, for doing all sorts of work. Is that what I'm assuming it's being for? It's a, it's a utility no. drone. No, no, no. They're building a drone airport for doing testing with the intent of future drone delivery from that location. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Yep. Well, the other thing was I, the, the my interest was an airport's good for that as well, but purpose-built airports and ranges and lanes of entry, that's, uh, yep, it's coming. Look out, watch that space. Um, and Singapore, the ones that took the lead on that, this, you know, they've, they've been doing it for a while. The, the Singapore police have a drone port on top of a building and they have lanes of use that, that go through the city um, for their drones to operate in. They've been doing it for a while. Yeah. Look, it's, we'll keep monitoring that one and see if the vertiport takes off. But the next one, thieves Boom. are not smart. Stolen electronic goods that broadcast their location to the manufacturer is asking for trouble. But also getting caught on camera during the theft, that's even more insane. Let's look. Oh, I love it. Now, for some reason, the audio. Right in front of them. There we go. Owners of the DJI in Scottsdale say they're in shock after a couple of people took off with three drones. Uh, I was here, uh, one of my colleagues, Hunter, he was actually here as well. Um, he witnessed the individual actually grab the drones and run out. Co-owner Ali Ahmed says this happened right in the middle of the afternoon. The suspected thieves, a man and a woman, had been coming in and out of the store all afternoon. When they rushed out with the drones, Ahmed says he and his colleague immediately ran after them, but they couldn't catch them in time. I'd already planned everything to where the car was backed up in the parking lot, jumped in, and they were out of there. The drones, Mavic 2 Pro and a Mavic 2 Zoom, were worth in total about $5,000, a loss that Ahmed says has been hard on a small business. He has filed a police report and at this point is just hoping that someone will be able to find them. The stuff was taken, um, and again, as a small business, that, that hurts us. Um, it, it's not a good feeling inside and just hopefully it doesn't happen again. So if you recognize the people on that particular video clip, or if you are that person, Apparently, there's a reward where if they get the original aircraft returned, they'll give you a drone. Now, hang on the a second a here. Drone. So someone is going to buy this eventually somehow yeah. um, and activate it, right? Yeah. So there we go. So as soon as that serial number pops up, right, which is going to be the first thing they're going to find, 
you've got the other end to come from as well. So you've got this end to start investigating and the camera shot. Then all you've got to do is work out where it changed hands in the middle. Um, that's going to be pretty interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's not like stealing, uh, you know, a, a, people don't steal phones anymore, right, for that very reason. What can you do with a phone that you steal? You can't really yeah. use it. You can't, you can't, it's too, it's too coveted by, and it's a transmitting device, you know. Are you going to take photos of yourself on the phone that you stole? I don't think so, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, it's the same thing. It's a, This is a camera yeah. um, with a serial number and a GPS in it. Yeah, it's a GPS return to home, literally. Yeah. But, uh, we've got one more quick story that's got three video clips in it, and I forgot to do the title for it, but most people would not think of birds as thieves, speaking of stealing of drones. Um, birds don't deserve to be locked up for stealing drones, but this footage makes you wonder. In the first clip... Is it a heron-type bird? Oh, well, look. not not this one. In the first it looks clip... Like, looks like ten heron. <laughs> Almost. Uh, let's just play the, the first hair. clip. In the first yeah. clip, you'll see a drone being stolen by an eagle with a shadow on the ground. So there, oh, we, there are. we go. And that's image stabilization trying to compensate for the oh, being carried by an eagle. You see a little bit of the wing there. Oh, that's the bird. fantastic. And a yeah, little bit later, tail. you see. That's the tail feathers. Yeah. There's the shadow down below. Let's go to the next clip now. Oh, that's fantastic. Where this did is you an find older that? clip. This is an older clip that I found on Drone DJ. So it's been <laughs> happening for a while. That one was in Australia. But the third one, let's go to the third clip. Have a look at this. Now, this drone. <laughs> it's not actually a drone. They've mounted a GoPro camera. This bird was um, a, a wildlife rescue. But they've gone and mounted a camera on on his beak to capture his first flight. They, the people who rescued him were actually running up and down the beach, flapping their arms, trying to teach him how to fly, and eventually they succeeded. And this is his first flight. That is absolutely incredible. I would have liked right. to see video of the people flapping their arms too. That would have it been It is funny. part of the video. It is part of the video clip. <laughs> oh, I'm um, going to have to go watch the whole thing then. Yeah, oh, yeah that's when, right. go wow, go wow, and wow. check out all of the videos that we have in our show today. You can go and check out the original sources by going to the description of our video. We've got links to everything. Go and check out those original yeah. sources and I look at them in last, more detail. That last clip would have been quite expensive, uh, Greg. I mean, did you see the size of the bill? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, uh, uh, Speaking of John, I got John. Worried. Yeah, John, you being an awful month, man, you've been zinging one liners out there that you you must have been working on new material while you were on vacation. I've been saving it up for you, Lloyd. <laughs> I, I, I thought 2021, it, it's time not to take things too seriously, you know. Absolutely. John, so, um, absolutely. You know. John, John, I've got the old <laughs> bill now for you. Here you go. You got the old bill? <laughs> Let's get the old bill up. Let's put put the last clip up. Where'd it go? This out. It's, it's coming. Good. It's coming. There we go. She's been back one day and she's already messing up. <laughs> Give her a break. Here's the old Bill. Ah, uh, the old Bill. Now, again, the music, I didn't have rights to use the music, but you... <laughs> <laughs> Drone footage of cops doing synchronized dancing is something that was too good to not put at the last part of our show today. Go and check out the link in the description to go and have a look at this together with the music and uh, have a good laugh at it. Wonderful it, stuff. It okay. doesn't look right without the music. <laughs> <laughs> it just it doesn't. Yeah, there's a few things. There's a lot of things like that, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine something like Yakety Sax in there or something as a substitute. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. Benny Hill. From Benny, Benny Hill. Benny Hill. Yeah, that would go down well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, we've come to the end of our show today now. Just a couple of quick community service announcements. If you want to send in something, upload at gregcoonett.com. Or if you want to send it, you, we've also got our Discord server. You can get in touch with us during the week through the Discord. You can follow us on social media, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, and DLive and many, many others. 
And there's a postal address for us if you want to send us anything physical. 5 slash 127 Princess Highway, Sylvania, New South Wales, 224. It's been absolutely wonderful having everyone here. Yeah. And Great to be back. One more time, one more time. Thank you, Angela, for being part of the show today. <laughs> and thank you for the super chat. Yeah. Oh. Thank you for the super chats. No oh, we just got a $5 chat from Lost Girl Hikes. Thank you for having me as a guest tonight. It was great <laughs> to meet your panel crew and channel crew. Thank you for being here. Very much appreciated. Thanks again. Yeah, okay. Great to finally meet you guys. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, go and uh, last comments and thoughts from you, John. Oh, look, I'm just pleased to be <coughs> back, everybody. Ready for the new year? And uh, we're going to keep our finger on the pulse this year and, and, and let you know what's happening out there and keep Australia and uh, our friends in the US connected by our wonderful hobby. That's what it's about, isn't it? Looking Absolutely. forward to it. Absolutely. Lloydie? Well, I'm just glad that John's back because I was tired of sitting in his chair and his material's fresher than mine. He, he's, you know, I'm just glad yeah. he's back. But you know what yeah. I always say, folks, be kind, treat each other better than you would treat yourselves. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. and this will be a better world. Yep. Yeah. And we just had a message from uh, Wayne King saying, let's have Angela back another time. So Angela, go and make Aww. some more videos and we'll talk about them another time. I sure. can't do the heart. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll okay. try. I'll try. I'll keep. I'll try to keep busy for sure. Good. Okay, that's all we've got time for. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for coming back for our relaunching of the original format. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone, and bye bye for now. Fly safe, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Take care, you guys. <laughs>